Um, I want to talk this afternoon about how uh, these efforts in print archiving and shared print agreements uh, have really hit the point of becoming mainstream activities. And where, where many of us have been talking about these for a number of years, and it started out as very much an edge case and, and, and sort of uh, forward looking now, it's becoming a, a more and more a routine part of academic and research library operations. And one way you can tell when uh, something is becoming mainstream is when the mainstream media picks up on it. Um, last, I don't know if you'd consider NPR mainstream, there are those who don't, but um, last fall, <laughs> last fall the, um, uh, an NPR uh, pop culture blog called uh, NPR Monkey C uh, picked up on another blog posting about uh, libraries destroying books and, and burning books and are we in a new era of book burning. And um, in the NPR blog she wrote a, actually a very nice kind of uh, for the mainstream audience explanation of the really hard choices that libraries face and why this is, why this is happening. So um, it, it's becoming a mainstream effort if NPR uh, blog is talking about it. And this, these were quotes from her, from her article. She says, if you're the library, how many books can you keep and at what cost? And that's really the, the issue that's, that's facing all of us. Uh, academic libraries are literally up against the wall, literally up against the literal wall. There are, there's no more space. There are no good options for how to deal with it. And several kinds of, of efforts are are underway, are, are being undertaken to address the re very real space constraints that are, that are driving these initiatives. For decades, libraries have been using off-site storage as a way to, uh, to deal with uh, space pressures on central campuses. In a lot of cases now, um, many libraries are now starting to, to make permanent migrations away from open stacks. And this is happening more and more in the context of the robotic uh, automated storage and retrieval system libraries. So that, for instance, San Francisco State, which is opening its new um, ASRS-based module, they're going to, to end up um, having, I think it's something approaching 50% of their collection is going to remain in those closed stack locations. Um, same with um, the University of Denver. They have relocated 100% of their main library collection uh, to an off-campus facility, specifically because they're doing a major remodel, and many of you in this room have undergone those same kinds of things. But they're, in the case of Denver, they're now having ongoing conversations about how much of what, what proportion, and it's likely to be small, will actually be repatriated to campus and how much will stay off campus. Um, libraries are also undergoing mass weeding projects and um, the newest approach is uh, what we alternately call print archiving or shared print agreements. You'll, you'll see me use those terminologies kind of interchangeably. Um, there seems to be kind of a migration away from calling it print archives because people say that archive means something else. So don't use that word. Um, another example of the, the going mainstream, this was the, this was the original blog post that the NPR one re referred to. Um, the, point, the point here is that librarians are not eager to downsize their collections or put their collections off-site or jointly own them with other libraries. We're not doing this because we want to. We're doing it because circumstances are forcing us to. And so this, uh, this guy in kind of a humor blog said, you know, it's like, it's like if you're a librarian, you're pushed to the point where, you know, it's like your best friend turned into a zombie and you're the, you're the person that has to kill him. So y you know you have to do it, but you don't necessarily enjoy it. So there's been a, a great increase in the number of shared print agreements uh, around North America. CRL was essentially the first many years ago with the JSTOR program uh, in which CRL has accepted J donations of JSTOR titles to create a print archive here in Chicago. Um, CRL also initiated a number of years ago the, the kinds of um, templates for agreements with other libraries to maintain JSTOR materials. But since CRL's 
um, initial approaches, a whole bunch of other ones, and the, and the ones I've shown here are just a few. They're just the sort of biggest ones, but there are a dozen or two dozen others that aren't specifically listed here that have stepped forward to create specific shared print agreements among their members. So what is a shared print agreement? I've outlined some of the attributes or terms and conditions that these agreements uh, tend to have. The, the one that's highlighted in yellow, the retention agreement, is in my mind the single most important factor that makes, that makes this a shared print agreement as opposed to a shared storage agreement, for instance. The, 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 pres the, the presence of a commitment to retain these materials for a specified period of time so that the other partners can rely on it is the sine qua non that, make, that makes it a shared print agreement. In addition to defining a retention agreement, these groups will also tend to define things like um, who owns the material, what's the business model for uh, supporting these materials, what's the governance, who gets to decide what materials get uh, retained, um, all kinds of operational uh, decisions about um, how do we decide what to prioritize, where are they kept, uh, what level of validation is done, that validation meaning a review of the materials for completeness and condition. Um, you know, is that, do we do none? Do we validate it down to the page level? What, you know, some decision gets made about that. Um, how do we know what's there? What kind of disclosure and discovery mechanisms are in place? And what level of access will we give to these materials? Um, I'm not going to go over these one by one. This is mostly just to give you an idea that there are a lot of these programs out there, and this is just a partial list. They, I've got them grouped based upon how they selected the materials to archive. In some cases, the ones I call a shared storage copy, they just took whatever was in storage already and said, we retroactively declare these to be archived for you know, 25 years or 10 years or 99 years or whatever. Um, in some cases, the libraries that are members of the group will proactively nominate titles they agree to take responsibility for uh, and the nomination is kind of ad hoc, it's whatever makes sense to that library's program. Um, in other cases, they pick by publisher or aggregator, and, and so you'll see a lot of cases where people pick JSTOR. Um, often these are driven by the fact that a digital copy is available. Um, the archiving by domain, we heard about that this morning with Amy's report about the, and um, Kathleen and Bernie's discussions about the law and medical, well, law, not law and medical, law and agriculture. And um, increasingly, these are being addressed in the, in the form of a specific collection analysis across the actual holdings of the individual libraries. So at the moment, if you were to, to look at uh, summary descriptions of all of the existing programs, there are, there's a certain kind of profile that's most common right now, but it's changing. Most of them are dealing with journals. Um, most of them are uh, dealing with journals based upon the existence of a digital version, like JSTOR or uh, Elsevier, Wiley, whatever. Um, the retention period that the, a plurality of them have defined is 25 years. You know, that's, that's this year's sort of common number. It might become different in the future. Um, in terms of ownership, almost all of them uh, wrestle with this problem for some lengthy period of time and then decide that the original owner will continue to be the owner because it's just too hard to do anything else. Uh, most of these programs do end up providing access. They are mostly light archives and not dark archives. And the reason for that is that that enables the other partners to feel like they have guaranteed access that enables them to deselect their own copy. Uh, if, if the archive is being presented as a dark archive, yes, there could be some provisions made for giving access to it, but it tends to not uh, give enough comfort to the other partners to be able to deselect. 
And the most common business model at the moment, at least, is uh, in effect no business model that the libraries just absorb their own costs, no money changes hands. There are cases where that's a little different. I wanted to just give you sort of an overview of the key features of the three biggest programs, the Western Regional Storage Trust, uh, the CIC Shared Print Repository, and the, and the ACEL program. And I think almost every library represented in this room belongs to one of these three. Um, and there's a huge amount of commonality. The real, uh, the real difference is in the business model of these uh, and, how, and the specifics of what they are archiving. Um, the West program and the CIC Shared Print Repository both have a funded business model where members pay a membership fee of some kind. Um, ACERL follows the more common model now where it's uh, kind of potluck. Everybody, everybody has expenses. Everybody just, it just all comes out in the wash. In the case of the West and CIC business models, they are both attempting to uh, facilitate the participation by uh, by their members and to promote um, and to promote the archiving effort. Uh, the difference between the two of them primarily is that in West, they share the cost of the front-loaded ingest costs, um, and, 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 on, and only that. In the case of CIC, they share those costs, but they also provide an ongoing uh, financial support to the entity that's retaining these materials over a long period of time, which in the case of CIC is um, Indiana University currently. And they hope to have other host sites eventually. Um, so that was, those were the current uh, most common. Uh, what's happening now, though, is a, a, cur a, a couple of other trends. There's a lot of interest now in, in archiving monographs. Uh, a lot of people have turned their attention to f trying to figure that out. And um, there seems to be more uh, action among groups that are trying to do a sort of a customized holdings comparison across their members as opposed to taking an a priori, we're going to do JSTOR or we're going to do Wiley or, or whatever. Um, and, and those two kind of go hand in hand. You know, they're, you, you almost have to do that for monographs, and so that's kind of driving that, that decision. Um, monographs will, of course, be a, a whole different ballgame. Um, these are some of the groups that are now grappling with the monograph shared print issues. Um, as Bernie mentioned, uh, recap the Columbia, Princeton, and, and NYPL consortium. Karen and David were here earlier, but I don't think anybody from RECAP is here now. Um, they are going to be uh, working a, to define shared print agreements across all their holdings, including monographs. Um, the main shared collections group has an IMLS grant to, uh, to, uh, to do a similar thing. Uh, Gwila is looking at um, monograph archiving and uh, same for the this Midwest group in Michigan. And of course, you all know that uh, Hathi Trust uh, Constitutional Convention in, <coughs> endorsed an, a, a, a program in principle to start exploring um, a print archives program of the print materials corresponding to Hathi holdings. So a lot of work is happening there. Uh, they will all have to deal with things like delivery issues, which may be very different from monographs compared to journals, because it's it's potentially more likely that um, service of journals can be handled electronically. That may not be uh, as easy for monographs. Um, copyright issues, if, if a lot of these decisions are being made driven by the presence of, of Hathi digital copies, uh, it's only a relatively small percentage of those that are in the public domain and there are all kinds of issues around that. And also just the efficacy of space reclamation. Um, when you are able to reclaim space for bound journals, you can clear many, many linear feet with a small number of decisions and a small number of transactions and physical actions. With monographs, it's altogether different. How do you make that, that actual uh, rec recognition of reclaimed space, uh, how do you make that work out? So um, 
as you can see, a lot of these are independent efforts going on independently. Um, and we, we're at the point, or a year or two past the point, where it would be useful to have a, an infrastructure to let this all get to scale. So there are two major things that, that need to happen to bring this all to scale. One is um, a kind of bibliographic infrastructure to, so, that, so that disclosure that these things are archived can be made widely known. And the other, as, as Bernie referred to earlier, is um, forums and mechanisms for reaching some community standards about uh, preserving print. The, there are two um, major efforts underway for developing this bibliographic infrastructure. Uh, one is defining a set of metadata guidelines for how to record things in WorldCat. Uh, the other is uh, CRL's Print Archives and Preservation Registry, which is a directory of print archiving programs that are underway out there, but it's also a, uh, a it also includes a, a collection analysis service to facilitate the kinds of, of, of uh, decision making that these programs are beginning to do. The, the OCLC Print Archives metadata project is finally nearly completion. In fact, it's, it's been um, developed by a sort of an ad hoc group of which I am one of people who have been active in print archiving. It includes uh, some people from OCLC, but it's not an official OCLC uh, product or, or service. But it was basically um, me and Constance Malpas and Dennis Massey from OCLC Research and Emily Stambaugh from the California Digital Library um, who enlisted the aid of lots of other people in the in the community to to with the goal of defining ways that libraries could could record their information in WorldCat for the purpose of sharing print archiving decisions without requiring any software development of any kind either at OCLC or in local ILSs or anything the idea was to take existing capabilities and so that libraries could begin to implement this with their own, on their own timetable with their own resources without requiring any new development. So we've, um, we have, are about to issue a report, hopefully like next week, <laughs> that finally says we've done this, we've done the testing, and, and we encourage libraries to go out and do it. Um, it's basically got a a three-part structure we're suggesting that libraries define a new institution symbol that would convey in addition to the owning institution that it would convey also that this was a, uh, an item that's under a retention agreement. Um, we're recommending that libraries create local mark, mark holdings records or local holdings records in the OCLC vernacular to record um, the retention actions and the uh, condition and completeness review if those were done. And those local holdings records would include 583 action notes which have uh, up till now been used primarily for uh, digitization actions, but we're suggesting an extension of that role to support print archiving as well. Um, CRL's paper system. Uh, is designed to use that same data so that libraries would not be asked to do a different format for paper than they might already be doing for, for uh, World Cat, Cat Disclosure. And uh, CRL has worked with the California Digital Library as the development partner. Uh, CDL is the one who's developed the actual uh, database and system. And um, for the collection analysis piece of it, uh, the Western Regional Storage Trust has served as the alpha site for uh, collection analysis. The way paper is envisioned, there, um, the knowledge base part of it will be openly available on the CRL website and, and freely searchable. And, and through open online searching, you can look up information about the individual print archive programs or, or consortial agreements, and you can also see their holdings that have been retained and processed under their agreements. 
for the collection analysis service that part which is would is invision as a sort of a specialized customized collection analysis worked out with the individual programs that would be provided as a feature of of CRL's global resources forum which is a program that CRL members automatically have access to and other members can other non CRL libraries can can choose to join these are some of the screen grabs and Amy showed some of them earlier so I won't really dwell on it but this is you know a listing of the programs that are in the test database right now this is an example of a West record it shows you know the different categories within West and which West has a has a specialized set of categories that correspond to different levels of validation and it shows the characteristics of those this is these are examples of library storage facilities in it this is details for a particular for Stanford's facility the searching you can search but it's basically a it's basically an empty you know an empty box search based on keywords from these various fields and here you can see for this I did a search for for West and this is showing some of the titles in West and the programs in some cases multiple programs that it's that it's archived under and then more details of an individual one and here's you know details down to the holdings that were processed I wanted to show you this part too up here it also has the ability to download as a CSV file the results of any search and it can also produce a gap and condition report to the extent that information is provided by the libraries that's the disclaimer that's part of the part of the OCLC disclosure metadata guidelines says if you've done a condition review and recorded things that are missing or things that are you know too much highlighting or whatever there's a place in the record to record that and to the extent libraries do that then then we can download a gap report or a condition report or both of them combined and the idea here is libraries could be looking to deselect something that they have locally but they want to know who needs it who's who's got missing who's got gaps for that or copies that need replacement and that would come also as a CSV file that you would download and then you could sort and manipulate it into all kinds of other things oh back again to the collection analysis the collection analysis basically takes holdings from the participating library catalogs and compares them against each other and against archived holdings to produce archiving proposals according to the criteria for that group and also deselection reports which I've decided we should change the name of and call them collections comparison reports or something kind of less negative than ominous less ominous than deselection so as I said it takes in data from the participants it compares it against other resource data notably the Ulrich sex and L data data from portico and clocks which tend to be pretty consistent pieces of the prioritization criteria and oh here I change it on this slide but not on the other one collection comparison reports so we have just reached the point where we have finished the first round of all this collection analysis for the West program as the paper alpha development site starting last fall and continuing up until just a couple weeks ago we ingested a huge amount of data there there are 102 libraries that are members of West some of them through consortia 83 of those 102 provided files of their journal holdings in mark format that were ingested into paper it was a total of 2.75 million records and we used paper to to do this analysis and to 
propose uh, archive holders and builders, which are West terms, um, based upon evaluating who had who seemed to have the deepest back files. So th this is this slide is kind of semi-intentionally dense with bullets because <laughs> um, it was a complicated process. Um, we. We ingested the two. Whoops, we ingested those two and a half million, 2.75 million. Uh, filtered them down uh, to process only the ones that had ISSNs for this go around, um, because we need those to match against Ulrichs. Uh, we grouped them into journal families, tracing the title change history to get uh, the complete list. Um, West has a concept of title categories, which are. Um, distinctions in different among titles based upon their perceived level of risk and whether there's digital copies and whether those digital copies are preserved or whether they're print only and that sort of thing. Um, so we did all of this kind of calculation, um, calculated the quote deepest backfile unquote just by looking at the earliest volume in the range and the latest volume in the range and ignoring the possibility of gaps in between. Um, and came down to 4,400 journal families. And this is how it looks in the West kind of terminology. So the, the end result is that using paper and some additional manual review, we have identified um, uh, 4,400 journal families and 122,000 volumes in those to be, to be archived. And then by extrapolating those out to the other library holdings, you know, there are millions of corresponding uh, copies that can be, that can be deselected. So um, this is very near the completion of the initial development phase for paper. Uh, the, the plan is to have the online paper directory, the online knowledge base, available um, near or very shortly after the end of June. Um, the paper collection analysis service, as I've said, has been actually operational for West uh, already. It will be at a point where other programs and groups could begin to use it after, after June, and as I mentioned, that the, the working assumption there is that it would require sort of a special arrangement with each library, with each group, because it needs to, to know what, what the uh, prioritization criteria are. And um, this, this comes back to the other sort of major effort to uh, bring all of the shared print activities to scale. And as Bernie mentioned, the um, CRL is playing a, a really important role in providing some of the foundational infrastructure for, for those fora. Um, uh, the, the Global Resources Forum is, uh, as I mentioned, the mechanism for getting the custom holdings analysis done through paper. And um, CRL has, over the last couple of years, uh, assumed responsibility for sponsoring the shared print group that meets on Fridays before ALA. Uh, it's been meeting in an ad hoc way for you know, probably close to 10 years now, um, but it's, it's become a much more substantial and, and kind of resourced effort in the past few years. CRL also supports a listserv for uh, those interested in print archiving called the Print Archives Network. And if you'd like to join it, you can send an email message to uh, CRL's listserv and subscribe to it. And um, uh, I guess the last thing is uh, that uh, for further information about uh, working with CRL on print archiving things, Marie Waltz, who is somewhere here, is um, the person is the liaison to talk to at, at CRL uh, going forward. So that was the um, speed talking version <laughs> about shared print, but I wanted to leave some time for, for questions that you might have.
It's the after lunch snack break. <laughs> Uh, hi, Elizabeth Park from Black. Uh, there are a fair number of us, especially in the Northeast, who are not part of the Indian Sports. Uh, so I'm wondering how best we can work or best us think about how to participate in shared trademark hiding in ways that uh, keep us from being free writers, uh, free hot, actually, for the uh, kindness of the members, as it were, oh, they're not afraid, kindness of distant friends. Uh, it also helps us not to be totally redundant and keep the same as everybody else is keeping their own point out. What is the way that we more accurate? How do we get started and how do we get started in a way that's sensitive to other activities in the international area? Right. Um, yeah, New, New England is um, blessed in a sense with having um, a multitude of of library storage facilities already um, and at least one shared one for the five colleges in Massachusetts but no part, partly because the population density is so dense uh, up there there's a there's um, there's been a sort of a separation of, of effort there have been some conversations in the last year or so about trying to figure out how to how to create a shared project across New England. I know the, the Boston Library Consortium um, is interested in promoting such a thing. Um, there may be a possibility that, I, I know that one of the long-term interests for RECAP is to uh, kind of serve as a node for that more in across the Mid-Atlantic and New England, but it, it will take a bit of time to, you know, to, to get their local arrangement together before expanding out to others, but as you know, that's a long-term goal of theirs. In, in the real short term, what we're hoping is that uh, libraries that are, have already made these retention commitments will begin to disclose them in WorldCat and paper where they can be reviewed so that individual local libraries that, that may not be part of a group can at least look to see what else is out there um, so that they may not have to uh, to archive the same things. Or conversely, they could decide we, we do want to archive these because there's only one other that's doing it and it's in California and we want to be the, the East Coast version. So uh, a, an, a very important point of the whole effort to define this metadata guideline was to encourage libraries to start revealing the decisions that have in fact already been made and to reveal them in mechanisms that are freely searchable by, by anybody. Um, but I would encourage you to, um, you know, to, to, to talk to the Boston Library Consortium. I forget if Dartmouth is a member or not. Um, there may be some, the, uh, the Hathi Trust effort, uh, which is going to be monographs focused uh, would probably be of interest to you as that gets off the ground. I think that was backburnered slightly while they solved the governance problems first, but they should be able to start picking up speed on that, I would think. Uh, time is speaking, right? Mm -hmm. What I'd like to know is how many libraries have been willing to give up title to share with libraries? Zero. Zero that I know of. Um, for monographs in particular? In general, just, um, just give up the, the, the monograph projects are, are all in the discussion stage now. I'm not aware of any that actually have agreements in place yet for monographs, uh, except for the last copy kinds of projects, like in Carly, uh, where, which is a slightly different thing. Um, in the case of journal agreements, the only one I know of where they actually gave up title is in the five colleges in Massachusetts where they give title to the consortium. Yeah. I, I also wanted to comment, remember CRL? We um, hun literally hundreds of libraries have given up title to particular copies of things by depositing them at CRL. 
in the past. That doesn't scale very well these days with the, the scale of the cereals problem is beyond that solution. But it has happened, and you, it, it's looking at the history of CRL, you could probably learn something about why it's happened at certain times and why it's less likely to happen now. Mm -hmm. Judy? We're in the process of getting an OU signed for the uh, Florida share print collection. Mm -hmm. And the premise of the MOU is that all of the materials that are deposited in what we're now called the Fire Act, Florida Academic Repository after many lengthy and tedious discussions. Um, but the, the premise is that, that the copies are owned by the shared collection. Now, of course, the core collections are coming in mm -hmm. from public academic libraries in Florida, so we're, it's remaining state property. But we do right. have one large private uh, academic library that is joining in that, and it is signed with the OU in terms of title for both monographs and okay. journals. Does it turn, is it turning title over to the University of Florida or the state of Florida system or? Yeah, well, exactly. Right. Um, it is turning it over to the shared collection, which is administered by UF on behalf of the group. We tried, it, it had to be turned over to a legal entity mm -hmm. and we did not want to set up a separate, some kind of a something legal right. structure. And so it's worded that we're sort of the guardian or custodian on behalf of. So, but we also didn't want to look like everybody was just building Florida's collection at the right. expense of another institution. So it's but, but it is turning it over to an entity. Symbol. Okay. It's yeah. being handled in such a way that it's clearly a distinct collection, not just a subset of Florida. But more than a distinct collection, it's a distinct organization. Because that's but not legally no. Okay. Because that's UF is administering it. Right. So technically, it is UF that is holding it, but we're right. not holding it within our own life. Right. The yeah. MOU, the draft MOU, is up on our yeah. uh, the Cecil.net website. If anybody wants to look at it, see what we're doing. Right. Because that, that's fairly typical of how these things are done, where they where they say the you know the collective group owns it. Um, but it may not be an actual transfer of legal ownership from from an asset point of view. Okay. Yes. I'm wondering about how much redundancy is necessary, um, and I think there's been some research on that. But is there an attempt to also kind of pull pull together that research and make that kind of go along with the, the recommendations of the plans and so on? Um, the, the research you're referring to is probably the, um, the optimal copies research that Ithaca uh, had done several years ago. And the, the specific context of that research was from an operations research standpoint, how many copies would there need to be, how many copies of journals would there need to be to, in order to uh, guarantee that every individual page could be reconstituted, uh, th that there were enough copies that every page could be um, found and would be in good condition and wouldn't be missing and wouldn't be marked up. So it was a, it was a operations research mathematical kind of calculation. Um, but there, it's a it's a continuing question, and of course, a big part of the underlying concept for all of this. I think a lot of us have been loath to make that be any kind of a prescriptive, what is the right number, because different institutions are going to have different comfort levels regarding what's the right number. So the, the thinking so far has sort of been um, the first stage is the disclosure of what's there um, so that libraries can make their own decisions about what's the right number for them. And the number, the number may vary by subject area or geographic area or something. So um, the first step is to reveal what's there. And some of, the, some of the discussion about possible future directions for the paper system includes the possibility of, of enhancements that would let libraries or 
groups of libraries uh, sort of look at the holdings of what's been retained and apply these uh, apply their thresholds to it. You know, I want to uh, show me show me cases of JST, of JSTOR titles where uh, there are uh, fewer than two copies held in the country, and that will tell me that I would want to make sure there was at least three, or, or that sort of thing. Yes? I was wondering about the 25-year yeah. average for retention. Is that, that doesn't seem very long to me. It, it isn't. Um, the, the tension that these groups are finding is a tension between the um, the libraries that want to deselect that material want that number to be as long as possible so that they have the most comfort in getting rid of their own copy. But the libraries that are holding that material are incurring an opportunity cost for that space. They're, they're saying, you are constraining my decision making far into the future, so I want that number to be as low as possible. So what, what a lot of these groups have found is that 25 is a number that seems like pretty long in the future and yet isn't an unenforceable number like in perpetuity. And uh, it's, it's kind of a compromise that, that feels kind of all right but doesn't really meet either side's needs totally. is the um, we uh, one of the reasons we became interested in working with LOMC is because they had this practice uh, of um, putting things that had been through destructive scanning into um, the salt mines in Kansas and that that was they, it was it's very good climate control very good security but it's it is dark archiving we've um, <clears throat> there are a number of libraries that are agree, have agreed um, in discussions with LOMC to archive non-destroyed copies of a number of these legal materials. Um, Columbia University is one, the University of Chicago Wright Law Library there is another, the LA, Los Angeles County Law Library is another one of those, and so there, there's two kinds of archiving in that point. But part of this, these are good questions, because part of what Liz Ann was describing and what Liz Ann has been through in working with West has been, right, we have a sense of ideally what we would like to do, ideally what, what the, the way and the circumstances under which we want to archive things, how many copies, what kinds of conditions, what kind of terms. But right now it's a matter of, in, at least in certain domains, figuring out what libraries are willing to commit to now so we can get these things in place, that we can get these agreements in place. A perpetual agreement is worthless because there's no term to it, there's no, so there's no definition of the quid per quo. Um, but the having established, what West is doing is establishing realistic expectations and commitments that these libraries believe they can stand by and are willing to commit to stand by at this stage. And that, as I said, it it's, will vary those kinds of commitments, that level of commitment to how many copies, to what kinds of conditions, to what kind of validation auditing, will vary from domain to domain, from type of material to type of material, and from community to community. And so I think this is extremely productive work being done. Kathleen, you probably want to start. Yeah, I just wanted to add to what Bernie was suggesting. Chicago. Okay, so um, uh, 
Judith Wright has been involved. And um, so the list of uh, libraries that we got together, in fact, we are looking at um, what does the legal library community do in the area, in this area. And uh, Bernie's exactly right now, we have this we can this dark archive um, in the salt mines, and we're committed to that. We provided um, metadata, um, and we're working with CRL to be part of this, uh, the print archive repository solution and um, distributed solution and Kent of Columbia, um, LA Law Library, University of Michigan, University of Chicago, they were all, you know, uh, they were all part of a discussion just to spearhead this in, in a broader context. Um, the only thing I wanted to, to add to that too is that, um, and I'll be attending ALA to, to update people, we've been updating the LIPA group as well, in this area. Um, one thing that the law library community has touched on in terms of this 25 year and what happens then is they seem more comfortable if there's a total solution scenario. So the idea of um, putting it somewhere with the mindset that we're gonna then digitize it methodically and then and and responsibly and then once it's digitized for some period of time, then it's responsibly um, stored in uh, the dark archive. So there's there's a flow to it. It's not this what happens at the end of 25 years, but it's the idea that it's going to be digitized. It's going to be available. If someone needs to print, they can still get it for some agreed upon period of time after digitization. But once that period of time's up, then it is put in dark archive. So you can see that but, but the digital image is available to all. That was the way we addressed the 25 Okay, with probably just one more comment or question. Uh, <clears throat> I was going to comment on the 25 year issue too from within ACERL. And the sense was that with respect to things like JSTOR in particular, <clears throat> that our willingness to have fewer copies might be clearer, we might have this national pattern, you know, and that we didn't want to lock ourselves into keeping things too far into the future when we might, you know, let's assume that in 25 years we're all really comfortable that five copies is enough and we have 25 copies, you know, so really it was sort of far enough to give us assurance that we would have, have enough new information to reassess and recommit rather than a lack of commitment to keep longer. Right. So it was sort of, I think very much what Kathleen said, but, but with maybe that little nuance of just an expectation that our decisions might be able to be different at that time. Good, thanks Judith. <laughs> thanks Lizanne, that was terrific. <laughs> so, um, in, we are now um, operationalizing this support for print archiving that, that Lizanne has been helping us with. And I wanted to introduce Marie Waltz, who is um, going to be the main, the key person at CRL on print archiving. Marie is not standing, she's just waving over there. Marie is, <laughs> thanks Marie. Um, Marie is a person and a symbol. Um, she's, in person, she's been um, working with the, um, Serial certification audit. She's also the symbol of the integration of the activity of digital certification and print archiving assurance. Those two activities coming together at CRL. So, hope, Maria, I hope you don't mind being a symbol for the next next little while as well. Um, we um, the there was a question about how do we know and find out about what's going on in print archiving. Those kinds of things. I think the um, the PAN, the Print Archives Network uh, forums at ALA, you're invited to feel free if you want to get on the mailing list, just email Liz Ann for those. Those have been very useful, they're very good sharing, information sharing venues. The other thing is that we are, we've done I think a couple of print web archiving, or print archiving webinars this year, CRL has, and those have been well attended and we will do more next year, so keep your eye on, on the CRL website and um, we will <clears throat> give you more about that. When, if you are not in the print archiving business yet and are thinking about doing it though, um, think about three areas, law, 
in particular, uh, think it, it might be good to think about it on, in, in terms of domains and think particularly about three areas where we are uh, going to be working actively for the next several years. One is the area of law. One is the area of history and economics of agriculture, defined broadly to include climate change, end of the world, and food <laughs> crisis. And <laughs> that's right. 25 years of the end of the world, whatever comes sooner. <laughs> um, the, what do the Aztecs have to say about this? And history of science, technology, and engineering, where we have our arrangement with um, Linda Hall Library is not just an access arrangement, it's an archiving commitment. That that will be uh, the place where serial archiving of um, <coughs> science, technology, and engineering historical materials, particularly serials, will, will happen. So this part of the program, um, I'm just going to brief you on, uh, briefly on things that have happened this year. We, um, <coughs> our role in, in the world, CRL's role in the world seems to be to um, provide a sh backup, if not assurance of backup, that um, on, of collections and materials and information that's that can't always be held locally or can't be managed by individual libraries or by commercial entities. Um, the question about this morning about the the archiving of news, David Maker's question about well, where is new, where is this, these digitized newspaper files being held, and you know, it, can we get rid of some of this paper? That kind of thing is very much the questions we're trying to answer. Um, these are the this is about the CRL's larger stake in the transition from primarily print-based operations, library operations, to um, digital based library operation to electronic access to materials. Um, we have a large body of materials, the serial shared collection, that is uh, slowly, and I, I stress slowly, being replaced by digital. And so we're, met, we're working hard. Everything you heard about yesterday and today is about our putting things in place to ensure continued access, whether it be paper or, or, or digital, too these body of materials and the kinds, these kinds of materials that CIRO is long committed to. Um, our certification activity, um, we, we got into certification a couple of years ago and we did that because we, um, it oddly enough grew directly out of work we did on print, on shared print, that we were looking at the conditions under which organizations aggregate materials from multiple sources and preserve those materials long term. And we looked at a number of print, shared print operations and came up with a, a, a good sense of the characteristics of the ones that were trustworthy, the ones that were working. Um, we started applying that, uh, those same criteria to electronic, to digital repositories. And we uh, worked with Robin Dale and the other authors of the um, trusted repositories, uh, the digital, trusted digital repositories criteria for sustainability um, to test those criteria and then to formalize them in the track checklist, which is now the basis, or which has been for years, the basis for judging and evaluating print uh, digital repositories. So that was our bridge from the print to the digital world. Um, we did, with the help of uh, support from Mellon Foundation, do a number of test audits and using the, um, the earlier criteria and then um, after the published criteria came out, we, we did a number, we've done, since the published criteria came out, we've done a number of audits of um, certain repositories of interest to CRL libraries. The uh, chief ones that we've done are, the two, in the last couple of years that we've done are Portico and Hathi Trust. We did this because we thought that CRL libraries were investing enough of their funding in uh, Portico and enough of the funding in Hathi Trust that it was worth seeing what's underneath the hood. That it was worth looking closely at these repositories, seeing how they operated, seeing how they were structured, seeing what kinds of um, what kinds of benefits and risks there were to them, and that that was useful to the CRL community. We've done that. We're now um, <clears throat> in the. Uh, we just finished this, a third. Uh, certification, which was Chronopolis, the digital repository operated by the U University of California, San Diego, and the San Diego Supercomputing Center. 
we did that because we thought it would be interesting to serial libraries to see a, a different model from the portico, the clocks, the, um, and the, the Hathi Trust models. Chronopolis is a very different kind of repository. It holds massive amounts of data, but it's a, it's a dark repository. It doesn't provide any service and doesn't intend to provide any service to these materials, but it, it operates fairly well. We, we, like, we like the model. We think it's, it's a good thing for, for what it is. We um, recently, our certification advisory panel, which has guided the certification of these digital repositories, um, has um, has been discussing the um, has looked back at a couple of the digital repositories that we've audited, and we uh, because when we do certification, it doesn't last forever. I mean, certification is uh, time bound. That after a certain point, two or three years, normally, the we have to go back to the repository. And the repository has to make certain additional disclosures, and those are disclosures about things like fundamental changes in their system architecture. Uh, events, negative events that have happened in their, with their content and with the repository during the course of the past couple of years, differences in the types of content that they're ingesting, that they're absorbing, those kinds of things, um, differences in the business model, differences in the governance structure, those kinds of things. Those are all types of events that would then trigger a new audit, a further look in them. Otherwise, the certification stays, it sticks. What we did with Portico was when we certified them, it was a limited certification. We were focusing on e-journals. We said, we felt that in looking at Portico, we could say safely that they were likely to continue performing as a trustworthy repository for e-journals for the indefinite future. That we, so we, essentially we certified them for e-journals. That was mainly what they were dealing with in those days. This was three years ago, almost three years ago. Uh, since then, they've taken on a whole new category of content that's, I think, of interest to us, judging from the discussions this morning and the, um, the discussions about licensing of these big databases. Portico's D collections are a new type of content. These are um, digitized historical collections, and they are now hosting, or they're, they're in the process of hosting, uh, 14 collections from Gale, Cengage, including a number of, new, of historical newspaper collections. The, Gale digitized the British libraries, I think, British 19th century newspapers and 18th century newspapers. So these, this is, these are fundamentally, and, and 31 collections from Adam Matthews also. These are fundamentally different kind of content than, um, than the e-journals. They also have forced Portico to change their business model to some extent on this. The e-journals archiving in Portico is being supported primarily by the libraries. Most of Portico's revenue for the e-journals preservation program is provided by libraries. In return, the libraries get access to those materials if they have to light up the archive. Um, with the D-collections, it's different. The publishers didn't want, and in some cases were not in the position to provide Portico those rights, the rights to provide access to all Portico subscribers of the D-collections. What they had decided was that they, Portico would have the right to provide access to 19th century British newspapers if Gale disappeared or failed to the people that already bought Gale 19th century newspapers from Gale. And so that was a different thing. Um, the other dimension of that is that Gale is paying Portico to archive these materials. And Adam Matthews is paying Portico to archive that, these materials. So this is a different dynamic at, at, you know, at work here. And we are now in the process of talking about whether we need a full-fledged new audit of Portico for this material to look at the same things we looked at first time around for the other material. So we will, um, we will know the uh, certification advisory panel is deep, deeply thinking about these kinds of things. And so we will report back when, uh, when there's some consensus on that. Um, we've been looking at clocks. We've been in discussion with clocks, which is something we haven't looked at. Um, really at, in any length. We did a test audit of locks years ago, about five or six years ago, which is ages ago as far as locks and digital preservation go. We did that from the sidewalk. Locks was not willing to let us actually do a real audit. So we said we'd stand out on the sidewalk and kind of peek in the windows and talk to people and see what people knew about locks, see how it worked. And, and we actually gathered quite a bit of information that way. but. We still, you know, we, we still didn't get to the point where we, we thought we could say for, with any certainty that this is 
this is it. Do it. Pay for pay for locks. Um, Clocks has come come to us uh, about a year ago and said that they would be interested in the possibility of having of going through an audit certification. We're still in discussions with them about. It. They have 77 publishers who, that have committed to adding their content to Clocks, um, and it, they're already providing access to five trigger titles. Um, and so the um, you know the, they're clearly important to the community, but I don't know how important they are to this community, to our community. I think there's a lot of overlap between CRL members, particularly large institutions, and CLOCKS, uh, the CLOCKS membership, but I, I don't know. And part of the discussion about what, whether they're going to undergo an audit is, all right, who pays for this audit? Um, the, um, the cost of Portico we absorbed because it was so widely subscribed to by CRL libraries, we thought that was worth doing. CLOCKS is not you don't have the same overlap. I'm not sure there's the same intensity of interest or concern about clocks from the membership. So we will we will poll you about this, and this is something that the certification advisory panel will help us decide on in the next next couple of months as well. You know, any questions so far? I know I'm talking really fast, but I don't want to keep us over our time. That we okay. Um, we are also in the process of. Um, looking at the Scholars Portal, which is an alternative in many respects to Clocks and Portico, both. The um, Scholars Portal is the um, Ontario Council of University Libraries uh, digital repository slash database. This is a large system uh, based at the University of Toronto that hosts locally all the digital content, or most of the digital content, subscribed to by the Canadian libraries. So this is a big body of material. It includes journal content as well as digital files and the big databases like the Gale things and the Adam Matthew things and those kinds of things. That's all lo lo hosted locally by virtue of the subscription or the contract with the, um, with the, the Canadian libraries. It also includes a fair amount of, of government information, geospatial data, um, which was awarded the, this year's Ontario Library and Information Technology Association Award for Technical Innovation. That includes land-based vector data about water and cultural features, census geography, orthophotography, and one assumes the end of the world as well. The, um, but this is an enormous amount of content. The Scholars Portal has negotiated with the vendors preservation rights to this material. That means that they have the right to light this content up locally and host, continue to host it co locally if the, um, the vendors, the property owners of this go off, offline. And so it's a very important um, operation and we, um, we are, have been working with them next for a couple of years, for several years. This might actually be an alternative in, in the sense that somebody asked me at lunchtime, would that be a possibility that in writing into the contracts for uh, digital database acquisitions or subscriptions that the, the requirement for putting a copy of whatever we license or acquire through CRL to, in the uh, scholars portal? And that's, that's certainly something to think about. There are numerous ways to deal with the um, preservation of these kinds of materials. We'll be, um, we're also in the process of doing an audit of the Purdue University Research Repository, which is a, essentially an institutional repository for research data. And this is something that's come online in re response to the National Science Foundation uh, require, and NIH requirements of data management plans for things. Aside from that, we are looking at, um, again, Hathi Trust. The, um, they have a new cost model, a new governance structure, and so you think these are all very positive developments with Hathi Trust. We would love to be able to, I mean, to rely on Hathi's monograph print archiving because then that would enable us to retire some of the CRL print monographs, that some of which are included in Hathi Trust. We, uh, there's not a big overlap on that, but there's a little overlap, but we think your libraries could probably do more. So we, we will be interested in what the details are of their print archiving program, but that, as uh, Lizanne said, is really just getting def beginning to get defined right now. So um, we are, though, <clears throat> because we, we think that, you know, we re recognize the potential and the, the value of Hathi um, in discussions with them about collaborations in the, in the area of not only print archiving but digital access 
two collections. So we, we don't want to have redundancy. We realize that people cannot afford redundancy, and so we have no desire to um, duplicate uh, what Hathi is doing. We, we hope they won't duplicate what we're doing, and so we are um, working together. One, another, another union symbol of that um, discussion is that Paul Caron is a member of Sarah's board and he's just been elected to a second term yesterday. So we'll, we promise to keep talking. No. All right, I think that's pretty much all. There's a couple of other digital repositories that are probably not worth talking about, but uh, well, maybe next year. So any thoughts, um, any thinking about, you know, is there things we're missing, things we're really not looking at, things we're overlooking? Yes? This may be a digital repository that I'm talking about, but I, I'm curious why you were in the Internet Archive. And one reason I asked that is, I recently had uh, an experience, uh, our, our copy of uh, the volume of Pastors' Lives of the Popes, uh, given with Louis II, was checked out. So I found Happy Trust as some, but not all. And then I found it in their archive. And I was, that's, just opened up a, uh, that's, that's a good question. They have aggregated an enormous amount of content from many of our libraries in the past, not CRL, but from many of the member, member libraries. Um, we, have done a couple analysis of their web archiving, um, but in terms of them being a trustworthy repository, we think there are real problems with governance. And one of the, one of the things that the track checklist does, and with and by the way, the new ISO standard now, which is based on the track checklist, which CRL Marie Waltz was a member of the working committee that developed that. Um, that some of those, uh, some of the more important criteria in there um, involve the requirement of accountability to the stakeholder community, and that the um, the governance structure for Internet Archive is just not there. It's not transparent enough. It's not there's no um, there's no continuity plan essentially for it, and it, so I, I think it would be a, it would be very difficult to. Uh, to rate them as a as a trustworthy digital repository, I think you know, I, you know people have talked to them about this, and people have talked to Brewster about wanting to have a real board, and you know, and that that would that would help to start. We had conversations with the Internet Archives about eight years ago about working together to you know, for them providing a platform for dissemination of CRL uh, digitized collection. These are very exploratory conversations, and it was clear that there was no possibility at that stage, and I, I still don't think there is one of the, our community really having any control of where that operation goes in the future. So the New York Times article didn't inspire a lot of confidence either, the shipping containers, really. <laughs> any more questions? Okay. Well, great. Thank you. This